And then uh, I went to Bible College in Rhode Island, not about an hour from here, and in, in, it used to be called Zion Bible Institute. Did you, you didn't go there, did you? Oh, in uh, Barrington, Rhode Island was when I went. So people, then, then I moved, I lived in Virginia, and I live in Pennsylvania now, and so as you know, New England has a reputation of being unfriendly. But it's not that people are impolite here. It's that, like the way I look at it, if you ha- are in line at Kogo or wherever, to buy something, and the person in front is being friendly. They're being impolite to you that has things to do behind them. And so I feel like New England people are the most polite people there are because they value people's time. They drive 85 miles an hour in the right lane because they know you have somewhere to go and the lane can't get blocked up. So I just want to say congratulations for never leaving the most wonderful place on earth, New England. How many of you are thankful to be in Connecticut? Can you say amen? Great state, great food. I don't know if you've ever been to Frank Pepe Pizza. Before I get into spiritual things, let me just give you other things that will help you in life. There's a pizzeria called Frank Pepe Neapolitan Pizza that's the best other than Al Forno in Providence, Rhode Island. So just some free food tips before we get on our way. You have great food, friendly people in their own way, and you're going to be in a hot revival meeting all week long where God's going to do great things for you. Can you say amen? So I don't know. I guess we might as well find out now. How did this meeting open up? How did you hear about me? Uh, Brian Tomes. Where your pastor just told me he saw me, there was a, a pastor there. He's a friend of mine now. In the, in the beginning, it was just like this, where we met basically when I preached. But he, uh, he was three years behind me in Bible college, and he was a major, you know, some people become pastors and just to relate to the people, they say they used to do drugs or whatever. This guy was like major into drugs, like breaking bad. He lived out in Nevada, uh, distributed meth among other stuff, started off in Dorchester, moved out west, branched out the operation. And then he got radically saved. But when he was in Bible school, when he told you he was a former drug dealer and addict, you didn't say, no, really? Like you could tell. He, he was like... <laughs> I mean, you, you can kind of tell now, since we're not being live streamed, I'm just going to say whatever I feel like saying today. So anyway, he graduates Bible college, and then he, uh, they don't have any reason not to give him a church in the Assemblies of God. You know, he completed all the courses and all that, so, but he's just different. So they thought, we'll give him this church in Western Massachusetts that's down to like 23 people on a Sunday morning. We're going to have to close it down anyway. It's already running out of money. And if he fails, no loss. Well, the exact opposite happened. The first time he had me come, which wouldn't have been when you came, it was back in like 2014. What actually happened, he got it up from about 23 to 50 on a Sunday morning. And then he had my father in. My dad grew up in, in Ledyard, Connecticut. He lives in Maine now. And uh, they had a guy, an old Massachusetts guy. You know, it's one thing if you're holding a revival meeting in Alabama and somebody gets healed. Nobody's seen anybody healed in New England since, like, Charles Finney was here. So, like, this guy's, this guy's in a wheelchair. He's, I don't even think he was a Christian at the time. He was like an old war veteran, paralyzed, not in a wheelchair because it hurt to walk. And while my dad was preaching, my dad didn't pray for him or anything. My dad was just preaching, and the guy stands up, and everyone's eyes were real big, and his eyes were big. Like, he was shocked. So he, he's on his feet going, I can't do this. I, I, I haven't stood. He hadn't stood, I don't think, in, in uh, I think it was just under 30 years. So word gets out, you know, everybody could tell the guy's not faking. You can tell. New England people don't fake. And I'll tell you another thing. When you've lived here in New England, you can spot another New Englander anywhere in the country. You go to Florida. I was at a Dunkin' Donuts in Orlando, and the lady said uh, at the Dunkin' Donuts, what do you want? I said, what part of Massachusetts are you from? She goes, she got, how do you know I'm from Massachusetts? Like I was a stalker. How do you know I'm from Massachusetts? Oh, I don't know, because you're 23 and you talk like Joe Pesci. <laughs> so, so this guy, you can tell he's not figuring. He has a winter coat, long beard, and, he, you know, he, he's shocked. Well, the meeting grows, and Pastor Brian Tomes up in Fitchburg, western Massachusetts, said, um, to my dad, what should I do to keep this going? It went from about 50 to 100. A bunch of new people got saved. That guy's family came and got saved. So my dad said, have in other evangelists. And he said, not guest speakers, evangelists. You know, not to give you a Bible college course, but there's five 
ministry gifts. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, when Jesus died, he went to the lowest parts of the earth and gave gifts to men. And the gifts are apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. So you hear that mocked all the time, even in church people. Very stupid, you know. You know how I know someone's an apostle? If they say, how I know someone's not an apostle? If they say they're one. You know, all these so-called prophets. Well, just because you met a couple of, you know, you could meet a construction worker that doesn't know what he's doing and puts in your cabinets wrong. It doesn't mean there aren't real cabinet makers. Some of the best ones are in this state, actually. So there's real apostles. Paul was an apostle. They say, well, you shouldn't call yourself one. Paul started his letters off, I, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. And then there's prophets. Elijah was a prophet. Then Agabus in the book of Acts was a prophet where the Holy Ghost would show them things that are to come. My Uncle Ted, I'm going to show you a video in a couple minutes. My Uncle Ted, my dad's oldest brother, who also grew up around here, he's a prophet. He's on, he's on television. He's in his mid-60s. And uh, I'll give you one example. I was in, um, and you can tell this guy is a good sound man. You care. You're going around the auditorium, like, can tell the sound, have your digital board. This is going to be a good week. It sounds great. You think I'm being sarcastic, but I'm not. That's the other thing in New England. You can't pay anybody a com- compliment because everybody thinks you're sarcastic. You say something, hey, nice haircut. You say, shut up. You say, no, I actually meant you have a nice haircut. So, uh, you know, I had my Uncle Ted in to speak on my broadcast. On, uh, we broadcast every morning on Facebook and YouTube and then at night on, on television to get the gospel out. So my Uncle Ted, we're leaving to go to lunch. I'm not trying to talk about anything spiritual. I just want to, I was actually thinking about a good place to go in Pittsburgh to eat. So we go out, and he goes, you know, you've outgrown this office. I said, I know. We were out, you know, my wife's sharing an office with three other people. We're up to about 17 employees now, and when we bought the office, we had like eight or nine. So there was a building kind of like here, right next to ours. And he points at it and goes, that's your next move. I said, oh, you know, I did see a for sale sign there. I don't see it now. I said to Magalis, my wife's uh, Puerto Rican twin sister, big hoop earrings, you know. I said, uh, find out about that building. And she goes, oh, it, it sold. It sold about six months ago. My Uncle Ted, without missing a beat, he said, oh, I guess I'll. He said, when you find out the sale fell through, that'll be the sign that God's giving it to you. Six days later, the owner of the building calls us, and he goes, hey, you know that building next to yours? He said, uh, they haven't made one payment on it since they bought it. It's been six months now. He said, so I'm taking the building back over. And for whatever reason, this guy's not a Christian, you know, because he owns a building and land, so you know he's not a Christian. He said, uh, he said uh, this, this building, I'm taking it back, but for whatever reason, I just thought of you guys and thought if you want it, uh, I'll, I'll help you get it. And he gave it to us for like an incredible Price. So everybody's moved in there now. Everybody say profit. profit. Yeah. The, the, Jesus said about the Holy Ghost, he'll show you things that are to come. I don't know why anybody would ever go to a psychic to find out things to come. First of all, look where they're operating out of. You're in a trailer, and of the word psychic, the only letters that still have lights are P and Y. So you're probably not a psychic that you know four of the letters were going to burn out. And then, But God has people that know things that are to come. Then an evangelist, which is what I am. An evangelist is, is like the sickle arm of God to bring in the harvest. And I could show you videos. We do crusades like people used to do in Africa and India. We'll do it in the inner city, North Philadelphia, uh, in the Muslim section of North Philadelphia, Newark, New Jersey, uh, Camden, New Jersey, highest murder rate, and go put a stage out and preach and have tons of people come and receive Jesus Christ. That, that's a grace from God because without the grace of God, they'd find you in a ditch with nine stab wounds missing your shoes. Amen. So then there's pastors. Everybody say pastors. Yeah. Yeah, well, I don't need a pastor at church. God's everywhere. That's an idiot you're listening to talking. God said, I will, I will give in that day shepherds who will watch over and care for your souls. So pastors, like an evangelist, goes after the one that got away and brings them in. Then the pastor trains you up. God doesn't just get you saved and say, well, best of luck. Hope you make heaven. He gives you a spiritual father that will watch over you. And then teachers. Everybody say teachers. Which if you've ever heard somebody that's not anointed to teach the Bible where it gets boring after like two minutes, that anybody th- you know, thinks they can explain the Bible. But then there's people that are anointed to teach that you could hear go on for 90 minutes. It feels like no time went by. And they help to, to unravel the mysteries that are in God's word. Anyway, 
My dad said, have in, to Pastor Tomes in Fitchburg, have an evangelist, real Bible evangelist that win the lost. He said, just like you had me in for a week, and without trying, the church went from 50 to 100. Well, let me tell you, Pastor Brian listened to my dad. He had the next person he had in because he said, well, I don't, I don't know anybody. And he said, have in my son. My, my son's a good evangelist. So, you know, obviously my dad's biased because I'm his son. Many of you will disagree with him in the next 30 minutes. But I do, I do my best. So I came, and that meeting blew up off the bat, supernaturally. They had prayed and stuff. They were probably up to about 120 on a Sunday morning at that point. I stayed for five weeks. Don't, it wasn't planned to stay five weeks. I was booked one week. And when you have more on Tuesday night than you have Sunday morning, and then you have double Friday night what you normally have Sunday morning, you keep going. So we went another week, then another week. We ended up going five weeks. And in a church of 120 people, we had 327 new people saved in western Massachusetts. Yeah. And, 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 like, and because of my friend's former drug background, he knew how. I'll tell you what ended up happening. Is the other churches in western Massachusetts, if they had a heroin addict come or a, like a young couple, young boyfriend and girlfriend that are both drug addicts, and they would tell the pastor we're drug addicts, they would say, we can't help you here, but if you go to that church down the street, they can help you, because they wouldn't just have them come. They would get them delivered. People, you look at the ushers there. First of all, it's the funniest church, as I'm sure your pastor would tell you, that you'd ever go to, because now they're up to about 850 on a Sunday morning, and probably 700 of the 850 have known Jesus less than five years. So like most churches, if you're preaching good, people say Amen. There, they stand up and whistle like they're calling a cab on 48th and Broadway. They don't even know what you're supposed to do. You know, you just hear some guy in like a Massachusetts echo, yeah, like you're at a Bruins game. So God, God has a plan. And maybe the Lord had me share this in the beginning to let you know. For all the dummies you'll hear in New England, act like this place is difficult for God to do anything. First of all, the church is growing in China where it's illegal to have a Bible and illegal to have public assembly. There is no place that the anointing of God can invade and turn that place upside down for the glory of God. And God loves New England. Can you say amen? I'll tell you, some of the greatest meetings I've ever had, and I'm not old, I'm 39, but I have been doing this 17 years full time. Some of the best revivals we've ever had have been in New England. People here are special to God. When God shook America the first time in the Great Awakening, he didn't do it down south. He did it out of New England. When he did it the second time it was in New England, this place, America does not swing based on what goes on in California. New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Philadelphia basically run the show in this country. And I'm going to tell you, this country does not belong to the devil. New England doesn't belong to the devil. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and all the inhabitants that dwell therein. God's not finished with America. You turn on Christian TV, I guess, you know, and I'm, on, I'm not against Christian television preachers. I is a Christian television preacher. But I will tell you, it seems to be that the easy thing to do is to just get on TV angry and start talking about how bad everything is in America, and did you hear this news story? First of all, there's 330 million people that live in this place. So every day, you could fr- find some wacko, do some wacko thing. But that's not America. Look at America now. The churches, even after they dismiss the kids, they're the most kids I've ever seen in a full gospel church. I've never seen, been to a church where 40% of the church was under the age of 10. It was like being in an Irish Catholic church in the 1850s. So, you know, there's plenty of people here. Watch how it'll grow this week. People are the hungriest. I'm telling you this is somebody that travels. People are the hungriest for God that they've ever been. In fact, I'll tell you what's going to happen this week that I, I got word of. I was preaching in Pittsburgh during uh, 21 days of prayer and fasting. And there was a, a, a young lady that had to go see a counselor from severe depression. The Lord radically delivered her. I didn't know any of that stuff. I know you. Montreal, nice to see you, and you're her husband, good to see you, probably could have done that after church, but it felt like doing it now, <laughs> nice to see you, my sister pastors in Montreal, and she used to go to that church, good, great to see you, glad you're here, I'm a little slow, it took me like 40 minutes to place you, but I got you, <laughs> so, uh, what was I saying before that lady interrupted me, <laughs> depression, yeah, 
So God, God delivers her from depression and delivered her so radically that when she went back to go see her counselor, her counselor, she told her, I don't need any counseling anymore. I don't need any. Th- I haven't had one negative thought. And the counselor could see such a change. This is in New York. They drove down from New York to Pittsburgh to get touched by God. Drove back to see the counselor. Did you know the counselor and her husband are planning on coming this week from New York to this church because they want to see what happened that caused a reversal that medication and all that can't do? God is real. Everybody say, God is real. Can I tell you another thing? God, say this. Here, I'll just give you some deep revelations. Say, God really cares. God's not a jerk. I know you meet a lot of people who serve God that are jerks, but God himself is not a jerk. God actually cares. I mean, you, you think. <laughs> you think how easy it would have been for Jesus and his Father, his heavenly Father, to sit in heaven and say, look at these people. I told, them, I told them one simple thing. Don't eat the fruit off of a tree, and they do it anyway. So enjoy yourselves. Knock yourselves out. I mean, that's how I feel. But you tell somebody to do something, they don't do it. Hey, not kill, uh, enjoy, enjoy it. God didn't do that. The Bible says God, Romans 5, 8, how God commended his love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That God was up in heaven looking down and saying, look, I know they blew it. I even think of Jesus on the cross. There's that guy mocking him as he's dying for him. Oh, you're the son of God. Why don't you come off the cross? I heard you do magic tricks. Why don't you get those nails out of your hand and come off the cross and save me while you're at it? What did Jesus say to him? Nothing. And then the the prayer Jesus prays is, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Say this with me. God is merciful. God God is a great God, man. So you got these people get on Christian TV, you know, God's angry with America, you know, and you're going to hear them because there's going to be fires and all kind of stuff this this year, just like God said in the Bible right before I come back. It's not because God's judging the earth. It's because the Bible says in Romans 8, that the earth is groaning against sin. And as sin increases, the earth's having a reaction to it. So all the fires and stuff you're seeing already, it's going to increase. doesn't matter how much they raise taxes to combat it, it'll increase more. Because it's a sign before Christ comes back. Floods, fires, wars, plagues, like you're having in the Wuhan province in China, those aren't going to go away. The Bible says those are going to increase into the coming of the Lord as a sign that Christ is coming soon. But God's not the one doing the judging. The wages of sin is, yeah, you know what that lets you know? Sin by itself with no help from God carries a payload and a penalty. You'd have to be really ignorant of the scripture, and apparently a lot of ministers are, to see a flood hit New Orleans and say God did that. So you're telling me God's, all those old ladies that drowned in assisted living centers in New Orleans that were church women, that God did that because he just got so angry. He said, you know what? I don't care. No. You can read in the Old Testament. God said, I will not destroy the righteous with the wicked. That's why there's something you don't hear preached on much anymore called the rapture. That before judgment comes, God is extending an invitation to get rid of sin. And there's going to be a meeting in the air where God will harvest the wheat and then the chaff will be burned. And so I'm telling you, as long as I'm here and as long as he's here, and as long as my father's up in Maine and, and, and preachers and Christians are here, it's not the time where God's judging people's sin. It's, a, it's an hour of mercy where the invitation is going out to all the hurting and broken. You, don't, you might have started on the wrong path, but you don't have to finish on the wrong path. You can call on the name of the Lord, and he will save you. Everybody say, he'll save you in the book of Psalms, and I'll add the second part that they usually leave out. He will save you and deliver you. Everybody say deliver you. From The Bible says he sent his word and it healed them and delivered them from all their destruction. So what good is it if you're bound by suicide or heroin addiction or severe depression or panic or all the litany of things that people battle with and you call on the Lord, and he writes your name on a book, in a book in heaven, and then, well, best of luck. That's what they teach in most churches now, that God, there's something for heaven, but then up until heaven, you're on your own. That's not the Bible. When you see Jesus, he did not tell, <laughs> did Jesus squat down next to the crippled man and say, listen, you may never be able to walk down here, 
But one day in heaven, you'll dance on streets of gold. Did he say that? No. He actually healed him before he ever spoke anything about eternity. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, 1 Timothy 4, 8, Godliness is profitable unto all things, holding promise in the life that now is and the life that is to come. How come God gave me that building next to my building? Because he was like, well, you know, you're going to heaven. You need a building for your office. That's your problem. No. The Lord that, the Lord that made provision for heaven has also made provision for your life down here on earth. And the Bible says in the book of Psalms, I will perfect all that pertains to you. I will perfect all that concerns you and pertains you. Read the 20, I mean, it's amazing how these like majorly known passages of scripture that even like sinners can quote, like the 23rd Psalm. People know them and then preach the opposite. The Lord is my shepherd. What's the first thing that happens when Jesus becomes your shepherd? I shall not want, or in a modern translation, I shall not lack anything. That's not just finances, though finances are included. God fed his children in the wilderness. God made their clothes not wear out. Their feet didn't blister. He healed them. He provides companions. Every need that you have is found in God. That's why God introduced himself to Abraham. Sorry that I'm preaching. I was just trying to make some jokes about New England, and I don't know what happened. That's why God introduced himself to Abraham. Genesis 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, Behold, I am El Shaddai. Everybody say El Shaddai. It's a Hebrew, Hebrew word. The God of more than enough or the all-sufficient God. Say all-sufficient. That means, Abraham, I know you live among Philistines, but I want to tell you something. If you serve me, you'll never have to go to them or their gods for one thing. I am your everything. I'm your healer. I'm your victory. I'm your righteousness. I'm your provider. I'm everything you need. You can find it in me. Has God changed? God will never change. So if everything you need can be found in God, and I'm going to tell you, no matter how tough you think you are or self-sufficient you are, you need, <laughs> I heard a guy on the radio who, 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 if I said his name, you'd know who he is. He, he's not a Christian and has never claimed to be. Far from it. But he was mocking on his show these people that go to church because they, I guess whatever helps get you through life, these people are weak and stuff like that. Then in the same program, he, he tells how he goes to counseling three days a week at $150 a half hour. So, I mean, you look around. We consume 80% of the world's prescription medication. So people can talk, well, I don't need God. Oh, you don't? What do you have in place of God? Well, I have my bag of medical marijuana. I also take this to help me go to sleep. I help this to help me wake up. This to help with my panic attacks. People, are, people have, you are not designed to get through life without help. And the Bible says, God is a very present help in the time of trouble. Church is not supposed to be the, the, the 80 perfect people that are left in Connecticut coming to meet together to celebrate that we still are perfect. Church is a place where hurting, broken people can go. <laughs> Let me tell you, that, that guy in the wheelchair, and Matt, wow, you guys like clapping stuff up here in New England? I feel like, I feel like I'm in Texas. Praise the Lord. You know, that, that guy that was in my dad's meeting, in, in Massachusetts, he didn't even have any faith yet or anything. He was sitting there. You know, you, know, you know how you know he didn't have any faith? Because when you get a miracle, if it's your faith, you don't go, whoa, I, I can't do this. You know, you say praise the Lord or at least try to say something spiritual. For him, I can't do that. You know, he didn't have any faith. You say, well, how can you get healed without any faith? Well, he had a little faith. He had enough, he had enough to go into the church. And then he stood up. You know what that was the Lord showing him? I love you. I'm real. I care about you. I'll tell you another thing that happened at that same church. This, this one shocked even me. I was just talking just like this. I hadn't opened my Bible yet or anything. Just greeting the crowd that kind of turned into a sermon. And as, as I'm speaking, this thing just like shoots out of my mouth from my spirit, which when I, you know, this was probably two or three years ago. When I first started 
When you go to Bible college, they, they call it going down a rabbit trail and that you should stay on your sermon. But I learned the way that the Holy Ghost will flow through me when I preach is I start off speaking of something, and it's not that I'm getting off on a rabbit trail. It's that I, it's actually the Holy Spirit pulling me onto the main message because God knows everyone that's there. And God ta- will tailor make something for somebody in the crowd. Like my senior year in high school, I invited uh, a bu- like eight of my friends to come hear my dad preach. Nobody had ever been to church in that. You know, I, I went to a regular high school in New England. So like the Jewish kids didn't go to synagogue. The Catholic kids didn't go to mass. I didn't know anybody that went to church. So I wanted at least eight of my friends to get to hear my dad because he's a, he's a master preacher and he always gives an invitation to get saved. And then God really helped me. My eight friends didn't want to come by themselves, so they invited some of their friends. And then by the end of the week, I had people I'd never talked to in high school coming up to me going, hey, is it okay if we hear your dad give that speech on Sunday? You know, that's New England. They don't know what a sermon is. They're just giving a speech. I said, it's fine. You'll enjoy the speech very much. So anyway, that day there were 66 of my classmates in in church, which there's only 400 kids in the school up in Bangor, Maine. So uh, my dad preaches. He gives the invitation to get saved. Everybody except my friend Dave, 65 of the 66 came to the altar and were crying, giving their lives to the Lord. I was like, I thought I had like accidentally got a hold of bad mushrooms. I mean, these kids that had no time for God, never cared, any, they're crying at the altar. I was like blown away. So Monday I go to study hall and my friend Jack, he was the captain of the football team. He, he had like a major anger problem. That's a, he was captain of the football team. He was like five foot three, but just on pure anger was a good football player. So he goes, I want to talk to you. I said, oh, okay. You know, he was crying. At the, he was one of the ones at the altar. I was like, what happened between them morning and now? I said, I said well, what's wrong? He went, I- I'm mad at you. For what? You know, he hugged me after he cried at the altar the day before. He said, how could you tell your dad everything about my life and have him share it from the pulpit? I said, I never told my dad anything. He said, okay, then explain to me why he talked about how you shouldn't sleep with your girlfriend. I said, that's in the Bible. (laughs) What do you you think God put? And just for Jack. (laughs) I said, second, well, I said, and you know, the Holy Spirit helped me. I said, Jack, how many people do you think were in church yesterday? He said, I'm 300. I said, that's right. What do you think I did? I said, first of all, were you the only one that came to the altar? No. I said, what do you think? I sat with my dad on Saturday. Dad, before you preach, let me just give you a rundown of the 65 people that are coming. Sarah likes to smoke marijuana. (laughs) So if you could just mention that at some point. So So he realized, obviously, I didn't sit with my dad and give him a briefing about every person. He said, then how did your dad know all that stuff? It felt like he was just talking to me. I said, Jack... Because it's not a religion or a speech. There is a God who knows you and he wants to get a hold of your heart to change your life. If you've had an encounter with that God, can you say a living amen? Amen. God is real. And he knows, Jesus said, he knows the number of hairs that are on your head. He cares about everything that has to do with you. And and I mean cares. Now, if I see somebody getting a, a major car accident here, and they're bleeding on the side of the road. I care, right? Because I'm not, and anybody here would care. You're not a callous human being. But I'm limited in my power. So I go, oh, isn't that a shame? Someone call the police. I hope they get help. But when you care and you're all powerful, and you said, if you call on me, I will answer you, God's caring is not just some distant caring. God will, God will get involved. In the intimate aspects of your life. So I'm, I'm in Fitchburg, right? I'm just talking. And then all of a sudden, this comes out of my spirit. And that now I'm sensitive enough to know when it's my spirit, so I'll just go with it. But I mean, just shot out. I said, uh, I said, what kind of idiot tells a lady whose child died that God needed another rose for his garden, so he took, he took her child? So everyone's just looking at me like, what's your problem? You know, we're not... not that didn't happen to anybody as far as anybody knows. And I'm just like, I'm like rebuking some anonymous minister who met <laughs> some hypothetical situation. So you're like, okay, I guess he, he needs to switch to decaf or something. And I just keep going. I said, God, God's not the author of death. God's the author of life. 
The Bible, T.L. Osborne called it the gospel in one verse. John 10.10. 10. The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Jesus said, but I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So the devil's a master deceiver. The, <laughs> boy, this is going to be a nice week. And, and it's not live stream? That's great. Say whatever I want, and it's my word against yours in court. Praise the Lord. And I'm a reverend. It's going to be a great week. The good Dunkin' Donuts. Get 100 miles away, they start messing up, but it's good here. We're going to have a great week. Say this so the devil can hear you. Say, God has something good with my name on it. He sure does. I can tell you that. So anyway, I, I, just, I just keep going. I said, man, I said, the devil's the author of death. I said, wouldn't it be like the devil to give you the worst problem you've ever had and then make you blame God for doing it? I, and, then, and then I rattled on like I just told you for about the next 10 minutes. I said, the devil's the author of death. God's the author of life. And if you'll turn to God, even the tragedy that broke your heart, I started talking about the anointing that binds up the brokenhearted, you know, the, Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord, Luke chapter 4, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bind up the brokenhearted. So when something breaks your heart, if you go to secular counseling, they'll tell you, well, that'll just be something that you battle your whole life, which in the natural is true. But Jesus said, there's an anointing or a flow of the Holy Spirit that'll take your broken heart and make it whole again. Let me tell you, just because you're so friendly this early in the morning, I'm going to tell you this as a servant of the Lord. Anything the devil has used to break your heart, God will make it whole before you walk out those double doors today, whether the devil likes it or not. You're not going to carry around an open wound for the rest of your life. You're going to lunch today whole and healed in Jesus' mighty name. If you believe it, can you say a living amen? Amen. So anyway, I get done with that little rant with everybody looking at me like, what's your problem? Finish the meeting up and go to the back room, sit down and have some water. And then the usher comes in, um, what's his name, Jay. Like 60% of the men are named in, the, in New England, Jay. Jay comes in and says, uh, hey, Jonathan. He said, there's a lady that wants to come give you a hug. And I feel like, saying, you know, that's why you're here, so that people can't just barge in the back and give me hugs. So he said, he said uh, no, I, I, I talked to her. She's not nuts. I think you should let her back. So I said, all right. So the lady comes back, and she goes, would you mind if I give you a hug? Like, well, she didn't look crazy. Like, what, dre- well-dressed, late 40s. You know, New England people aren't huggers. New England people are handshake people. I, I, I said, sure. So she gives me a hug. She says, you know, I've never been to church before. Well, I, I have felt bad because I felt like if you've never been to church before, I shouldn't be your first person you hear. I should be like at least number like five. You should have like warm-up people. And she goes, I've never been to church before. And she said, my son died when he was five, just a few years ago. And she said, I couldn't take it anymore. And I said, God, if you're real. Massachusetts lady driving on Ashby State Road in Pittsburgh. God, if you're real, I need to hear from you. And she said, a voice spoke immediately. This isn't in Central Africa. This is in Massachusetts. A voice spoke, God's God everywhere. Go to that church Tuesday night. She was driving by Crossroads Community Church. And, you know, had driven by it every day for work and never seen the sign. That's the devil, like blinds people. They know where every Dunkin' Donuts is, every sit-go. And then there's a church across the street from their house. I didn't know there was a church there. So she goes on Tuesday night, just like the voice said, comes in late and sits down. And when she sat down, I quit talking about it and go, what idiot tells a lady that lost her five-year-old son that God did it? It was the Lord. <laughs> so now I have her attention. She said, did you know that the minister that did the funeral for my son said everything that you said, that God needed another rose for his garden, and so he took, and I thought, if that's God, then I don't want anything to do with him. And you, so it wasn't me calling him an idiot. It was God calling him an idiot through me. So I'm off the hook. <laughs> I don't know if Judge Judy would see it that way, but that's how I see it. And she said, when you said that, I understood that it was the devil that did that and not God. And, you know, I I wonder with the Lord having me say that today, I wonder how many people here are not only in bad shape or something happened, but somehow a religious person 
used of the devil, made, made you think that it's God. Well, I guess God. And let me tell you, you can go to a ton of churches, probably everyone but, but this one this morning. But if you, if you want to blame God for bad things, you're in the wrong meeting. Because the Bible says in James chapter 1, every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights in whom there is no variance or shadow of turning. Do you know what no variance means? That means God never changes. Do you know what makes me want to serve God with all my heart? I don't wake up every morning and wonder if God woke up on the right side of the bed today or not, whether he wants to curse me or whether he wants to bless me. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that you might have life. For all the churches you could sit in today and hear somebody ramble on about, I mean, you know, the Lord has us go through hard things. If God wanted you to have a hard life, he'd have kept Jesus shut up in heaven and let us all die in their sin. Jesus didn't come to compound the problems of life. Jesus came to lift the heavy burdens of life. Yeah, wasn't it Jesus that said, Matthew chapter 11, I know I haven't opened my Bible, but if you listen, I've quoted a lot of stuff word for word. Matthew chapter 11, 28 through 32, come unto me, all ye that are, Weary and heavy laden, and I will give you. That's not what they taught me in church. I mean, you know, when you come to the Lord, it'll be hard. Jesus didn't say, come unto me, all ye that are having fun, and I'll show you how lousy life can be. <laughs> come unto me, all ye that are enjoying life. And once you meet me, you can walk around like the third guy from the left on the evolution chart. <laughs> Look like you were baptized in pickle juice. How are you today? I'm blessed. (laughs) That's not what Jesus said. Come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden. Now, Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ, the same. Everybody say the same. Jesus Christ, the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. So when he said back then, come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden. Think of the lady on Ashby State Road in Massachusetts. God, if you're real, I need help. Because what happened with my son, I, I, can't, I can't live anymore. What did God say? You know, oh, now, now you want help? You haven't gone to church one time in 30, and now you want me? Is that God? No, that's religion. Oh, now you want these people. You know, you hear people preach like that on TV. These people, they do their own thing, and then they get into trouble, and they want help from God. And God doesn't mind. Who was up next to Jesus on, on the cross? A nun? Or a thief? None or a thief? It's not a trick question. You're not going to say thief. No, actually, if you read it in the original language, it was a nun. There was a thief next to Jesus on the cross, and he wasn't stealing Snickers bars if he was having capital punishment. And you know what that thief said? He said to the other thief, are you going to mock God in the last hour of your life? We deserve to be up here. Now, he wasn't gesturing because his hands were were nailed. But you get the point. He said, uh, we deserve to be up here. But this man has done nothing wrong. That guy had been around criminals enough that he could look in Jesus' clean eyes and tell he hadn't done one thing wrong. And he said, for the record, I believe you're the son of God. When you go into your father's kingdom, will you remember me today? What did Jesus say? A little late now, isn't it? (laughs) No. What did Jesus say? Truly this day, you will be with me in paradise. God is not moved by your by your nice things you do, by that you put your change at the sit-go into into the Easter seal's little jar. That helps those people. That doesn't get you into heaven. Charitable contributions don't get you into heaven. Doing nice things don't get you into heaven. Putting your faith without faith, it is impossible to please God. What's faith? Faith is believing that God is who he said he is, that God will do what he said he would do, and that God's word is true. So think of what the thief said. When you go to your father's kingdom, obviously, whether he heard him live or heard secondhand, he knew Jesus was not just a rabbi, that he said, I'm the son of God. So to say, when you go, you're about to die, when you go up to your father's kingdom, will you remember me? You know what that showed? He believed the message that Jesus spoke. And when the guy said, if you're the son of God, if, if, if's not faith, if you're really God, God, Jesus never answered him. God, Jesus didn't punish him. It's not like the one guy said, if you are the son of God, help me. And Jesus, Jesus turned and said, you die now. That didn't happen. When, if you want to operate in unbelief, 
The Lord will let you do whatever you want. God gave people free will. People are free to choose. People do whatever they want and then blame God. Well, God allowed it. God would allow me to go rob the Dunkin' Donuts on my way back to the hotel, but he didn't make it happen. He didn't commission it. So he was quiet to the person next to him that was in unbelief. But when, when that thief, rotten person, he didn't even say, well, first get cleaned up and put some clothes on and then we'll talk. Hey, just for the record, I believe. Everybody say, I believe. I believe you're the son of God. When you go to your father's kingdom today, will you remember me? Well, you know, first you need to be baptized and you've never given one thing to the temple. Truly this day, you will be with me in paradise. God's greatest insult is to be doubted. I don't believe that. You know, you sit by people on airplanes like me. Then they find out you're a preacher. I told my wife, when people ask me what I do for a living, I'm just going to start telling them I'm an assassin. (laughs) Because I'd probably get a nicer reaction than when I tell people I'm a preacher. Oh, what do you do? That's a nice suit. What do you do for work? I'm a a preacher. Oh. Then they just turn and never hear from them the rest of the trip. But I'm an assassin. Oh, like James Bond. Tell me more. I don't know what, what, because basically people people have an issue with God that the devil planted in their life that God actually had nothing to do with, and then they they take it out on you, which is fine. That's part of the job. But you hear their objections. You know, I had one guy. Well, I don't believe the Bible. Why not? It's full of contradictions. Here, show me one. Well, yeah, just keep repeating what your seventh grade uh, humanist teacher told you all the way to hell. You never even looked at it for yourself. Can you say Amen. I had a lady behind me on the tarmac in South Africa. I was waiting to get on the plane, and it was one of those ones where they didn't have the jet bridge into the plane. It was my one day off. I was preaching two weeks straight, morning and night, and then Saturday was my travel day. I was tired. So whether this makes you think less of me, I can't control that. But I wasn't looking to, like, lead anyone to the Lord. I wanted to get on the plane and go to sleep, and I didn't feel like talking to anybody on the runway. And I was dressed in, like, a track suit. I looked like Whitey Bulger in 1968. Had it zipped to about here. I didn't look anything like a minister. And so, on purpose. And so, I, I'm getting on the plane. The lady from South African Airlines is right behind me. And so, because of how I was dressed, I guess she assumed I was not what I was. So, she goes, man, I don't know what you have planned this weekend, but as soon as I get you guys boarded on this plane, I'm off for four days. Me and my girlfriend found this place. They have margaritas for five rand. You know, rand's the money in South Africa. And they're really good. They give you big mar- margaritas. And they don't, they don't uh, cheap out on the alcohol. And she's like, they have good music and good DJs. She's, you know, running, running it and running it. If people haven't talked and you tell them you're a minister, then they go, oh, I, I actually go to church. I'm one of the deacons. But then once they've said a lot of stuff, then, then it's like they've hung themselves. So then she gets all done talking. And she, go, she goes, you, what are you, a DJ or something? I said, no, I don't even know how to work my playlist on my iPhone. I said, no, I'm not a DJ. She goes, well, what are you? I said, I'm a minister. She goes, oh, shoot. <laughs> so, you know, I was out of, you didn't bother me. I went to regular school and stuff. I'm from here. So she goes, uh, well, you know, now people have to, like, justify them. Well, I'm sure Jesus was a good guy, good guy. That's underselling it quite a bit. Like this guy wrote me on Twitter on Easter. He wrote, anyone can die. I wrote back, the trick is getting up after. (laughs) Just down across, my friend. The tomb is empty. So thank God the Holy Spirit gives you what's, because even then I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. You know, go, go, go party. What do you want me to do? So she starts talking, you know. Well, I'm sure Jesus is a good guy, was a good guy. But she said, I just think the Bible, which is what they teach in a lot of parts now that like universities have gone all through Africa, the younger generation says this now. In Af- the, the older generation, when you go to Africa, by and large, they have like respect for the church and stuff, but the younger generation is starting to turn like here. So she said, I believe the Bible was written by white Europeans to enslave black people. I'd never heard that before. You know, I didn't grow up in, in Africa. But the Holy Spirit knew what to, the answer was. And I, I wasn't even interested in answering. So when she said, I believe the Bible was written by white Europeans to enslave black people. I said, I'm going to tell you. I'm gonna, I, said, that's not, I said, that's wrong, and I'm going to tell you why. And when I said that, I thought, I'm looking forward to hearing why. Because I've never heard that in my life, and that just shot out of my life. I said, let me ask you a question. 
If I was a white European man looking to enslave black people in Africa, when I wrote Genesis 1, would I write, man, all men are created in the image of God? Or would I have written, white men are created in the image of God? Would I write that Jesus was slain for every tongue, tribe, nation, and race? Or would I write, Jesus was slain for Englishmen in London? And she laughed. And said, I mean, it's amazing how the Holy Ghost will give you one answer. She said, man, I never thought of that before. Did you know even when slavery was legal in the United States, they had a slave Bible where they had to change a bunch? There's no way. That's why they have to ban this first thing in any country that goes against God. Because this book, if you read it without anybody messing it up for you, one thing you'll get from chapter 1 is I am created in the image of God. I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. I'm not created to be the tail. I'm created to be the head. I'm not created to be cursed. I'm created to be blessed. Hallelujah. Yeah. Chinese. Puerto Rican, Dominican, Jamaican, Central African, English, German, Russian. Jesus died for everyone. God created man in his image and in his likeness created he them. Can you say amen? She said, wow, I never thought of that before. And I said, then the Holy Ghost kept flowing. I said, because even I had to be, I said, do you think it's an accident that on the day before, on the flight before, you go to party for four days, which nowadays, no guarantee you come back after the four days, fentanyl and everything else. I mean, it's a bad time to be a sinner and a good time to be a Christian. I said, do you think it's an accident that before you go out with your girlfriend for four days to go party? The last flight, you're standing by me and God confused you into thinking I'm a DJ so you'd start talking about parties. She said, no. I said, now, do you think the Lord did that so you'd feel bad about going to party? Or do you think he did it so you would give your life to him? She said, I believe that. I said, let's pray. You know, the line's still going. There are a few confused European businessmen looking back. That's their problem. Go fly on another plane. You flew on the plane I'm on. So things happen. So I, 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 grabbed, I grabbed her hand. We prayed on the tarmac. She cried. She hugged me. She said, as soon as I get you on your seat, I'm going to call my mother. She'll be so happy. Somebody always has a mother somewhere that's praying. Can you say amen? amen. She went up and told the lady up on the plane, she said, give this guy a good seat. But she can't. You know, the plane's full. Everybody gets the same seat. He's a good guy. So then I talked to her about the Lord. God's, you know, the, this week, why well, have church? Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday through Friday. That's a lot of church services. By Tuesday, some of your families are going to think you joined a convent or something. Some of them by tomorrow night. Where are you going? Church. Didn't you go yesterday twice? I did. Have you murdered someone? Are you going to be on forensic files soon? What happened? There was a lady at one meeting where we did a week of meetings, and some of the meetings went long during the revival. Actually, I think it was at my friend Brian Tone's church up in Mass. You know, people don't know anything. If they do know a little bit about church, it, you, they might know about the Catholic church and stuff. So, like, this lady that had never been to church gets invited by her friend, gets saved, baptized in the Holy Ghost, gets on fire for God. So she goes back Sunday night. Then she goes back Monday night. And then... Uh, her husband goes, where are you going tonight? You know, your wife's just been going out every night, coming back at like 1130. You get a little concerned. She goes, I'm going to church. He says, you know, I won't say what he said, but basically conveying that he did not believe she was going to church. She goes, no, I am. So he looks at her, he lets her go, and she's not back at 10. She's not back at 1030. So he goes on the find my phone thing. I was like, I'm going to kill whoever this guy is sleeping with my wife. He, he's going he's gonna to need church when I get done with him. So he, go, he goes to the find my phone and waits in the parking lot. And then we come out after church. Actually, I think he ended up coming in at the end, wondering, what, the, what is this? You know, and then he ends up, it's amazing how the Lord will work everything out. I wonder who's here today that if somebody would have even told you two years ago that you'd be in church on a Sunday morning, 
listening to a very unrefined preacher. And you'd have stayed through the whole thing and not stormed out in the first 15 minutes. You'd say, not me, man. That's, that's not for me. But whatever happened, it's not that God sent the problem. You understand? God didn't kill that lady's five-year-old kid so that she'd come to church and hear about him. But what the devil means for bad, God will take it and turn it for good. Turn to Luke chapter 7. I'll read you one story. Luke 7, verse 11. Praise God. This is going to be a great week. I'm not saying that like in faith. I can tell. I I can feel it. I was telling uh, Jay and Nick that are driving with me, my nephew and the guy that runs our media department. Sometimes I go fly to a place on Saturday, and I don't feel like anything in my spirit, like, then even Sunday morning, I don't feel anything. And then sometimes, like yesterday, which is very pleasant, I'll fly somewhere, and the whole time I'm on the plane, it's like I feel like preaching and, and like stuff. You know, and I'm not studying or anything. But stuff to preach on starts coming to me. I don't know whether you guys fasted and prayed. For, yeah, well, that explains it. Because th- then there's like a draw. You can ask the guys. I can even tell whether there's going to be a lot of people there at night or not a lot of people. Because sometimes, I'll, like, I'll wake out of my nap early. And, and start feeling something. And you can tell there's not only people, there, there, there's like a pool. Like they're coming wanting something from the Lord. And sometimes they don't. And you guys do. You're an odd bunch. This lady in the purple and black, just put one hand on your lower belly. And lift your other hand up to the Lord. Your friend there will hold your book for you. And he'll give it back at the end or we'll call the magistrate. Right underneath your hand, the Lord touches your kidney and your pancreas, and all your blood levels come to normal in Jesus' name. I tell you, you're not going to have to tough anything out. As your days are, so shall your strength be. You're going to have the healthiest year you've ever had in Jesus' name. You believe that with me? Lift your other hand to the Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now you can have a bonus. Take that hand you have up in the air and put it on your heart. The Lord strengthens every part of your heart. Again, any level they'd read out of your blood, pressure, sugar, otherwise, it all goes perfect in Jesus' name. Amen. Nice to meet you. Luke 7. Then I'll let you go so you can go to Pub 99 or wherever you eat. Luke 7, 11. Soon afterward, Jesus went with his disciples to the village of Nain, And a large crowd followed him. A funeral procession was coming out as he approached the village gate. The young man who had died was a widow's only son. And a large crowd from the village was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion. Say it with me. Say overflowed with compassion. Did that meet you in Connecticut? Like... Oh, you were a Christian. Nice to see you again. Probably could have done that. Well, thanks for opening the door. Nice to nice to meet you again. Could have done that after, but I'm still kind of an amateur. The young man who had died was a widow's only son. His heart, say it with me, overflowed with compassion. Don't cry, he said. If you have a King James Bible, weep not. Everybody say, don't cry. Is there a lot of crying in heaven or is there no crying in heaven? God's will. I don't know why people always thought it was holy to be just like, oh. Jesus didn't find people that were happy and make them cry. He didn't find a happy child and slap him and make him cry. Jesus, if you read the Bible, found people that were not, I was going to say sad, that's underselling it, that were in deep sorrow. Because this wasn't just a lady's son that had died. This was a widow whose son, so her husband's already dead, which is terrible in any country at any time in history, especially back then. Women can't get jobs and stuff. You're just finished. So you got a son who's not only your son, but your only hope of any kind of provision, and now he's dead. So this lady's not crying, like, because you're supposed to cry. 
This lady's life is over. Dead husband, dead son. And when Jesus saw her, he didn't say, well, that's what you get for Adam and Eve eating the apple. No. When he saw her, the Bible doesn't say he had compassion. The Bible says his heart, what with compassion? Overflowed with compassion. Don't cry, he said, which if that's all he did, then he's just a jerk. You tell a widow who's burying her son, don't cry. But there's a reason he said don't cry. Then he walked over to the coffin, touched it, and the pallbearer stopped. Young man, he said, I tell you, get up. Hallelujah. Then the dead boy sat up and began to talk. I'm sure a few people need to change their khakis. (laughs) I'll tell you, I'd I'd have needed raised from the dead. And Jesus gave him back. To his mother. Now, if you could have Jesus in a picture, it's that paragraph. Stop the crying, and I'm going to take away the thing that was making you cry, and I'm going to give you back what will give you joy. Un- Everybody say joy unspeakable. That lady started crying, tears of bitter sorrow. And when Jesus got done with her, she was crying tears of overflowing joy. That is the message of the Bible. Jesus didn't, you know, this is basically what I heard in Pentecostal church growing up. How many of you know Jesus is our comfort when we go through the storms of life? that's That's not right. If Jesus was a comforter, then when he saw the woman getting ready to bury her son, what would he have done? Comforted her. Hey, you'll see him again in heaven. That's all religion does. Religion doesn't have the power of God. I'm talking dead religion. So all they can offer is comfort. Oh, your son's on heroin. Very sorry to hear that. You know, um, hope, you know, we just hope he comes around. Well, somehow we hope it'll work out. No, but Jesus, the Bible says, before he began his ministry, went out into the wilderness, led by the Spirit, and fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and returned in the power of the Spirit. See, this is what separates Christianity from every other religion. Buddha taught things. You never see him heal anybody. Muhammad, same. Confucius, on down the line. Lots of people taught stuff. But when John the Baptist sent his disciples back to say, are you the Messiah? Are you the Son of God we've been waiting for? Or should we wait for another? That's a yes or no question. Jesus didn't answer yes or no. Jesus said, go back and tell John the Baptist the things you've seen today. The blind see. The deaf hear, the crippled walk, the lepers are cleansed, the dead are raised, and the poor are having the gospel preached to them. Hallelujah. He didn't comfort people. He didn't say, come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you a hug. He said, I'll take your burdens, and in exchange for your burdens, I'll give you my rest. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Hallelujah. One more story, and I'll I'll let you go to lunch. Praise God. I think I just woke up. My nephew, Jabeck, there is a, is a witness to this. My mother-in-law, who's my mother-in-law now? Back then, I didn't know, know them. They lived in the Bronx, my, my, my wife's family. Puerto Ricans in the Bronx in New York. Take my uh, wife's oldest brother, Jose, in a car two days before Christmas in the Bronx and hit a New York pothole. And New York potholes are considered canyons in most states. Hit a pothole, and it jars the car so bad, the back door flies open. This is like, you know, 1980, 81. No car seats. And ejects Jose out of the car. So he hits his head on the pavement at like 25 miles an hour, swelling on the brain. They, they take him to uh, whatever hospital, Beth Israel, or, or no, that, that's here. I can't remember which one they took him to in New York. So he's on full life support. Breathing tube and breathing machine. Uh, feeding tube through the throat. And it, nothing's working. No sign of life. And so they tell my mother-in-law, nobody's a Christian in the family. Um, listen, we, we've done everything. He's, you know, they need the room, basically, is, is what, what it, they, they, they need you out. So we're, we're going we're gonna to take him off life support. My mother-in-law, like this lady in Luke 7, 
If you can see yourself as these people in the Bible, it'll help you receive from God. Not just some random, you see, you're going through that? That's what, Je- what God does for one, he'll do for anyone. He cares. Jesus cares. So, uh, she says, my sisters are coming down from Massachusetts. Will you leave them on till the morning? They get in at 5 in the morning. Can they just see them one more time and, and then pull the plug at 8 in the morning? Okay, they give her till 8 in the morning. Well, my father-in-law, who was not a Christian, who was not close to a Christian, but every Puerto Rican knew this one evangelist from Puerto Rico. Any Puerto Ricans here? Who's the evangelist from Puerto Rico? Correct. There's only one as far as Puerto Ricans are concerned. And every other one, like me, is an imposter trying to be like G.J. Avila. Because G.J. Avila was no, had, you know, major miracles, like born blind people healed and stuff like that. So anyway, he's in the Bronx doing a tent meeting. And my, my father-in-law, Abednego, knows it. So he, big mechanic. I mean, he's 75 now. I still call him, so he's got like huge hands. He looks like he could just like crush my head. So he comes to the back where G.J. Avila is before the service. You know, no ushers can stop him or anything. just lowers his shoulder and goes. And he comes back in and goes, G.J., my, my son is on life support and is going to die. I need you to leave here and come with me to go pray for him. That's, that's, that's the kind of faith that gets him, you know, forget all these 5,000 people. They can kiss off. My son needs help. And so G.J. says, I can't leave these people. They've come, they need miracles too and need help. But he takes his pocket handkerchief out. Takes Goya olive oil, the only kind any genuine Puerto Rican would ever use, and pours it on his scarf and hands it to him. Acts 19.11. And God, God uh, God gave Paul the power to do unusual or special miracles that even handkerchiefs that were, were taken and aprons were taken from his body and laid on the sick, and any sickness or disease was healed, and any evil spirit came out. He said, take this and lay it on your son, on his body, and your son will be healed. My father-in-law took that word from him, goes to the hospital, pushes my mother-in-law out of the way, and starts wiping the cloth over his body. They had so little church knowledge, she thought he was doing Santeria. So, so she starts pushing him. Abednego, this is no time for that. And he holds her off with one hand and then finishes and says he's going to be fine. And he looked as dead when he finished as, as when, he, when he started. So he leaves. She leaves to go pick her sisters up, rest for a little bit. The sisters arrive. They drive there, get there at like 6.15 in the morning to cry over his body for another hour and 45 minutes till they pull the plug. And when she rounds the corner and goes into the room, he's sitting up, all tubes out, eating cereal, and says, hi, Mom, like that. And he's the one. I don't know whoever called from the church. That's who answers the phones in our office now. He's in his mid-40s. So when I read this, See, you can't let this book ever be a dead book. Well, Jesus healed that. That's how they preach it. They take the the power out of it. Jesus was in, Nain was a village about 30 kilometers from the Sea of Galilee. And it's very arid this time of year if you ever go. We actually did a trip to, who cares? It's not a weather report. It's a story of how a lady was getting ready to bury her son, and when Jesus came on the scene, not only did she stop crying, she got her son back, and her tears of sorrow turned to tears of joy. And I felt like standing on the chairs right now, but in case some of you, this is your first non-Catholic service, I'm going to take it easy on you and stay on the floor. I'm telling you, these stories gushing out of my spirit, just like talking about that kid back in Fitchburg. Everything the devil has done in your life that has turned life into pain and crying. And maybe you can put on a nice face for about three and a half hours to leave the house and do what you have to do or go to work, but your heart's broken. And you, you, tears are normal for you. Just sit in a room by yourself and cry. Has Jesus changed? No, he's not. And if he could take a lady in 15 minutes... And change her from crying tears of sorrow 
to tears of joy, holding the thing that the devil took from her. Then the same God of that Bible that's alive today in Connecticut, I can tell you of a truth. When you call on him and say like that lady did on Ashby State Road, I can't make it on my own. This thing that the devil used in my life to turn my life into misery, I can't go anymore. But I know if you'll touch me, if your presence will come, you'll turn it around for my good. God will listen to your cry. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you what another great white evangelist used to say who preached with G.J., R.W. Shambuck. There's nothing the devil has done to you that God can't do something about it today. Because that's why people miss it. They think, well, I've been going through this for 30 years. Let me tell you, God doesn't need equal time of what the devil had to turn it around. The word immediately is used 55 times in the Bible. All of it is in the New Testament, and most of it is in the... Life, ministry, deliverance, miracle ministry of Jesus and the apostles and the disciples. You're never going to read that a man was blind and Jesus prayed for him and over the course of 11 years he got his sight back. God is an instant turnaround God. I said God is an instant turnaround God. How long did it take God to create the whole world? How many days? Six days. How long do you think he needs for your life? He's not a weak God. He's a mighty God. And he said, if you call on me, not I might answer you. Then go to another church if you want to hear a message. I mean, sometimes he says yes. Sometimes he says no. Other times he says wait. That's not in the Bible. Call on me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that he knows that you know not. Here, I've been rambling on for an hour and 15 minutes, and I'm here all week. But I'm telling, man, from the time I was little, two weeks out of the hospital, my parents didn't have a house. My dad traveled full-time as a preacher, still does. We were on the road, Sunday to Friday, travel Saturday, Sunday to Friday. From the time I was a kid, I've seen God do the impossible. Cancer withered away people. That even if after they got healed, they looked at like they were at death's door. Then come back to the church two years later, and they're fat. Remember me? I was one that had stage four bone cancer. You prayed for me, and I got healed. I put my weight back on. Good fat. Can you say amen? Amen. Make fat thy bones. I will perfect that which concerns you. Let me tell you, there's a blessing for setting your alarm and rolling out of bed on on the one-day-a-week holiday in New England called Sunday where you mow the grass even though there's snow and trim the bushes even though they're not growing. (laughs) And instead of taking that to my one day, you took it and you planted yourself in God's house. And let me tell you, the Bible says, those that are planted in my house shall become fat and flourishing in the courts of God. When you take time in your schedule to honor God with the first hours of a new week, God has a blessing with your name on it. I want you to lift your hands wherever you're seated unto God. Unto God. Father, as you've opened this door to send me to the great people of Connecticut, I thank you that today will be a day of miraculous turnaround. That if the devil had his way, what people were supposed to carry for the next 40 years and cry and just carry an open wound and can't watch certain things on TV without it triggering memories and all that stuff. I thank you that you turn it around today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And not just invisible things or things from the past. People who have been diagnosed with things that they can treat, you know, They might be able to extend their life from six months to four years or whatever. I thank you. If you can raise the dead, then what's congenital heart failure or diabetes or pancreatic failure or whatever? Everything that is named, I thank you that it bows to the name of Jesus today. And I prophesy in the name of Jesus, whatever has caused tears of sorrow will be turned to tears of joy before lunch. Let this lunch be a celebratory meal for the people of God who are here. 
where when they pray over the food, it's not some dead blessing. They'll say, surely the Lord has done great things. In Jesus' name. If you can raise a man out of a wheelchair that doesn't say, I'm not able to do that, then what can you do for people who have faith? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Blessed be your name forever. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Blessed be your name forever. I'm going to read you one more scripture, and then I'll pray for you. Anybody ever heard of the book of Job? Yeah, everybody always reads the first part. Nobody ever reads the last one. I'm like, Job, nothing ever works. Why don't you read how it finished? Job's whole ordeal, Bible scholars tell us, took 18 months. And at the end, verse 10, Job 42, 10. When Job prayed for his friends, the Lord restored all of his fortunes. Everybody say, God is a restorer. In fact, the Lord gave him double what he had before. Verse 15, uh, 16, Job lived another 140 years after that, living to see four generations of his children and grandchildren. Last verse of the book. Then he died an old man who lived a long, full life. Job went through 18 of the roughest months in recorded world history. But how it started is not how it ended. When it finished, God put a stop to the assault and then refunded him double everything he lost. For every devil that's told you the opposite or put it in your subconscious, let me reverse it. However life started is not how it has to finish. All of the devil's victories are in your past. But let me tell you something about the devil. He's not as bad, big and bad as they crack him up to be in church. The devil has no ability to determine your future. And when you hook up with Jesus, Jesus rewrites your future. And like Job, there's going to be people today that your life started badly, but it's not going to end badly. It's going to end as a testimony of how God can take the lowest and set them on high. Somebody say young. Somebody say old. It's only a matter to God. Job wasn't 11 when that happened. He was 17. He was already an old man. God had him live another 140 years. He was super old. He was getting A-A-A-A-A-R-P. <laughs> if you think about it, that joke doesn't even make sense, but it's funny anyway for some reason. <laughs> well, I know. I believe God can do that, but I'm, I'm 65. Job was way older than you. Don't let the devil say, I'm old now. You know something? God, like, God likes old people. God likes young people. He blesses the young, and he regards the aged. If you listen to the devil, who have you, Biden? You know, when I'm starting in the ministry, you have to remember, you're a young minister. So what? Psalm 23 doesn't kick in when you turn 48. It's written to everybody. And I'll tell you another thing. The promises of God don't start dying out when you get older. He blesses the young, and he regards the aged. There's nothing to settle except what you're going to believe or not believe. If the devil has his way, you'll be dead by the end of the year. Miserable life. If God had his way, you'll have life abundantly. And the choice lies with you. Choose you this day who you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. God said, today, Deuteronomy 30, today I set before you blessing and curses, life and death. Oh, that you would choose life that you and your descendants might live. It's not God. You know, it's, well, I don't know why God. God has his blessing. The devil has his curses. You choose which side you're going to walk on. And when you choose God's side, the Bible says you will never be disappointed. That's in the New Romans 10. And you will never be my people, Joel, uh, Joel 2. And my people will never be put to shame. And that's what God wants to do in this country. You're not meant to be an asset for the pharmaceutical companies. For them to help manage your depression and manage your made-up diseases. New made-up disease every month and then suing the company next year for the science. Life's not a game. Jesus paid for your freedom with his blood. CVS and Walgreens shouldn't be able to extract one more dollar from you. You If you want to buy orange juice or something, but you, you get what I'm saying. He's a healer. I said he's a healer, a mighty healer. He's a mighty deliverer. I started to say the reason we're having church all this week 
is God not only wants you to get delivered and blessed, God wants there to be an army of people in Connecticut that know the power of their God. Because you know what happens? Like, like that story I told you. That, that, that girl gets delivered from severe depression and tells her counselor. Now her counselor and husband are coming. Because when God does something for you, you become a preacher without trying. Now the next time somebody shares with you about their heart problem, you, know, you don't wait for them to figure, oh, well, you think that's bad. We didn't hear what they said about me. No. You say, I know. You say, I know that's true. But you know what? Let me tell you what God did for me. And then faith comes alive in their heart. And then you pray, and God answers your prayer. Because God doesn't care how many years you went to Bible school. He cares about faith. Can you say amen? Amen. Can you say a better amen? amen? I see your best days are yet to come. Some of you thought the last time you ever laughed and enjoyed life was 1997. I have news for you. 2020 will be the greatest year that you've ever had. God has good things. God wants there to be people in New England, Puerto Rican people, black people, brown people, yellow people, plant, any color, whatever. Ran out of colors. God wants there to be people. Don't have some. You should come to church. Why? I don't know. They're having. They want to say, hey, listen, God has helped me. And my God will help you. And that day is today. Why should you have to wait one more day? God's interested in helping you now. Would you mind if I prayed for you? I thought you wanted. Come right out to the aisle. Just lift both hands where you're at. I know in my spirit, without getting into too much detail, that you separated yourself from some people. That it was like you knew if you stayed with them, Things were going to end badly. You made difficult decisions and it separated from them and then started separating yourself unto God. And the Lord tells you today, he has seen that. I didn't come into the sanctuary at 10, 11 because I'm lazy. I came in so that you can say, did he talk to the pastor about me? I haven't talked to the pastor about anything other than I asked his wife where they were originally from. Stores, Connecticut. That's the only thing I know that I didn't know when I came in. And I tell you, the Lord says, I've seen the tough decision you made, and now as you've separated yourself unto me, I separate my power unto you. All of the litany of things you need God to help you with, that you've even looked at some of your friends and say, they have so-and-so to help them. Who's going to help me? The Lord says, I'm going to be your help. Praise God. You don't have to fall down. If the, if the goal is to fall down, I'd have everybody lay down at 1030 and get up and dismiss. But if you do feel yourself falling down, don't hold on to me because I'm the problem. God's going to help you. I said God's going to help you. God's going to help you. Every head bowed, every eye closed. You can bow your head and close your eyes. I won't sneak up on you and push you down. If you're here today, I want to ask you the most literally, The most important question anyone will ever ask you. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? I mean know him, not know about him, not you read the Bible. I'm talking you are living for God, living free from sin, living a holy life in a world that mocks (laughs) righteousness and holiness. David Wilkerson prophesied before he went to heaven about the great falling away, that Christians that have been gone to church and raised in church their whole life, and the Bible says it, there will be a great falling away, a great departure from the faith. That's not talking about sinners. To depart from Hartford, I have to have at least been in Hartford. So when the Bible says people will depart from the faith, it's talking about people, they believe in God, and all, but They let the fire go out. The oil ran dry. Do you know how many people there's going to be in heaven? I mean in hell that that believe in church, believe (laughs) that the Bible's a great book, even that it's the word of God, but they're not living holy. Be ye holy as I am holy, for without holiness no man shall see God. 
Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, be ye perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. God gives you grace to be able to do that. But you have to do it. You cannot allow this great country we live in called America to start to interpret the Bible for you. Well, you know, I know it says that, but it's different now. It ain't different now. You're different. God is an unchanging God. And the Bible says in Isaiah, Woe unto those who call evil good and good evil. That's where we're living now. If you want to do whatever wicked thing you decide to do that the Bible calls sin, they'll celebrate it on every afternoon talk show. And if you want to live holy, live with one wife and raise your children in church, they treat you like you have a mental illness. But who cares? Because one day when there is no more ABC, CBS, NBC, CNN, MSNBC, and all the other channels, one day when there's no more United States of America, there'll be a kingdom of God. And every man will stand before that God and give an account for what he's done. There's not an American God and a Canadian God and a European God and an African God. There's God. There's Jehovah. And he set his word, and his word never changes. And I want to call you today to live for Jesus Christ. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, two, two, let me just break it into two things. Number one, if you're here, and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ publicly. Why do you have to do it publicly? Jesus said in Luke 12, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father that's in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father that's in heaven. Billy Sunday said, if you can't kneel for Jesus in a church, how will you stand for him in the world? So number one, if you've never done that, I'm not asking if you go to church, have you ever committed your life to Christ? I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that. Secondly, if you once committed your life to Christ and things went haywire, messy breakup, a divorce, got, got just without realizing it, you departed from the path of life. And the Lord's calling you today to get rid of sin. Don't give the devil an open door to ambush you. Cut his hand off by living for Christ with all your heart. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all all your soul, your mind, and your physical strength. If you fall into either of those two groups today, either you've never publicly received Jesus Christ or you once did, but you fell away and you said, Jonathan, I want to give my life to the Lord today. I want you to quickly put your hand up high and we'll pray together in Jesus' name. I see your hand. I see your hand. This is not you joining the Protestant church and Anyone else? I see your hand. That's awesome. Uh, I'm a happy man. Very quickly, those of you that lifted a hand, just quickly stand up and come to the front and we'll pray, and I won't keep you long. Come right now. No problem. Today's your day. Awesome. I know you're a brave man if you're wearing that shirt here. Come right up. Stand right across the front. Come on. Nice to see everybody. See your face, man. We're not going to hurt you. Just lift your hands to the Lord, and I'll give you the prayer to pray, but, but say the words from your heart. Say this. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father I give you my life. I give you my life. I live in New England. But I'm not going to live like New England. I'm going to live like your Bible says. I'm going to live like your Bible says. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my sins. I believe in my heart. I believe in my heart. You raised Jesus from the dead. I confess with my mouth. I confess with my mouth. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And my Savior. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Fill me with your power. Where I was weak, make me strong. In Jesus' name. I'm saved. My sins are forgiven. I have a new life. In Jesus' name. Stay there with your hands lifted and let the Lord touch you. I'm going to pray for you. I bless you in Jesus' name. 
This is what I'm going to pray. Father, the same way that you've helped me serve you for however many years, 35, whatever, by your grace, give that to my friends. That it'll never be difficult serving the Lord. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. Be blessed. Every private battle that you fought, the Lord lifts it off your shoulders right now. Yes. In Jesus' name. You're going to have the best year you've ever had. Be blessed. In Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Be healed in your body. Strengthened in your body. Listen, the Bible says, your bones like iron. And right now, God supernaturally reach out and bless all of your bones. You won't ache in Jesus' name. I missed you. Father, this guy that has muscles in places I don't even have places, touch him today. In Jesus' you're going to have the best year you've ever had. And I'm going to tell you, by a gift of the Spirit, the Lord's going to show you things that are to come, like I talked about in the beginning part of the message. You'll always know the right decision to make by the Spirit. You won't have to find out the hard way ever again. In Jesus' name. Welcome to the family of God. Before you go back to your seats, your sins are all forgiven. God, there isn't like a starter club with God, and then after like a few weeks you get into the real thing. God doesn't remember one thing you did before 12.04 p.m. this Sunday, Eastern time. So I want to invite you tonight, 7 o'clock, come back, because I'm not a stand-up comedian. It's not like you heard my routine. I'm just going to do it the rest of the week. But God will build every service. Yeah. And I'm glad you came. Congratulations. Very proud of you. Give your new brothers and sisters a big hand clap. Love you. Thanks for coming. That's awesome. You want prayer? I can tell you. Lift your, lift your hand. In Jesus' name. God's going to help you in everything. Now. God's going to send, I believe he's already sent people, but he's going to send adults that are going to help yes. pay for stuff and make life easier. And God himself will personally help you. In Jesus' name, be healed in your body. Even anything you were born with that's uncorrectable, I thank you, Father, that's corrected. Now, in Jesus' name. Stay back where you are, but just step out to the aisle. I'll pray for you from here. So I don't scare you too bad. Just lift your hand. I won't sneak up on you. Close both eyes. Now, whatever testimony you've heard about what God's power has done, and it piqued your interest enough to think, you know, I could use a little of that in my life and help. God's going to help from today. This is not for all of you, and I won't point out the specific person because it's nobody's business. But it's like if somebody gets placed in your life that's a bad person that you don't have anything to do with. You know, like when you're a teenager, if, you're, if your mom dates a guy that's a bad guy, that's not your pick, but you have to be around for that kind of thing. The Lord will remove that person and protect you. In Jesus' name. And that'll be a sign to you that God's hands on your life. God's going to help you. When I say help, I mean help. Like the 
devil set things up before they were born where it been the easiest thing in the world for them just to go to hell. No money, no good influence. And the Lord ended around that whole thing to carve you a different path. Father, the same way you helped me. song should we play to end the service? Massachusetts. We're this close to the Red Sox. Do you know Sweet Caroline? <laughs> if you could learn it by tonight, it would be great. <laughs> hey, left in the mic like Paul Schaefer. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Lift your hands one more time all over this place. <laughs> by the way, you did a great job today. And I, I'm not very complimentary. All faith-filled songs. Very nice. Sometimes people get like three songs in, I feel like quitting the ministry. So thank you. Hallelujah. Man, I feel like real good. When I used to feel like this when I was like 12, I'd get paddled before the end of the day. But now nobody can paddle. Because I feel like 100% of the people that needed to receive Jesus Christ did, and then like everybody that had a burden that needed lifted, it got, I feel like it's like job done. The house is completed being built. Uh, my friend that's sitting by, the guy with the muscles, who also has muscles, stand up if you would. Lift both hands to the Lord. God's going to bless you for being a soul winner and for speaking out about Christ to help people. You never do it in a condemning way. You do it because you want to really see people get helped like like God's helped you. And you've spoken about Christ to people that, that just like, some have received, but lots have mocked and stuff. And you do it anyway, undeterred. The Lord is going to bless you. For did I not say in my word, blessed are those who are persecuted for, for my sake. Like an old preacher told me, he said, when people yell at you, they really want to yell at God, and he's not available, so they just use you instead. So when you take God's yelling, he gives you his blessing. And so this year, you're going to get promoted. You'll get promoted above people who mocked you, and that'll be the Lord's way (laughs) of having the final say. (laughs) When the person who made fun of you now works for you. That'll even wake a a heathen up. Amen. Thanks for coming. Where'd you guys come in from? Glad you came. Where'd you hear me before? You don't want to come to church here? No. That's the Lord. Nice to meet you guys. If you want to follow me to my other meetings in case people get out of line, I'd love to have you. Just remove people from services. <laughs> you would be interested in that. I got that. <laughs> That was an enthusiastic head nod. <laughs> We'd have some fun. Praise the Lord. You mind if I pray for you, my Boricuan friend? Come right up. Lift both hands, close both eyes. Keep your left hand up, put your right hand on your lower belly. Anything that's in your body that wasn't planted there by God, the Lord uproots it and takes it out right now, right underneath your hand. There it is. In Jesus' name. You know, on, on the radio, they say guys like me pay people to do that. Where would you find the people to pay? I'll fall down when you pray for me for cash.com. <laughs> then there's like a thing to fill out on the website. How many people would you like? Everybody say what I had you say in the beginning. Say God's real. real. He's a real God.
Glad you're here. The Lord's going to help you. Let me pray for one final person, and then I'll let everybody eat like I've been promising for 40 minutes. <laughs> Two people, and that's it. <laughs> Sir, if you would, put both hands where your heart is. And then I won't have you stand up, but this lady that's the nicest dressed lady in the room with the, yeah. Put both your hands on your heart. His is for his physical heart. Yours is for your heart, like we talk in English, like emotionally. The Lord gives you a whole heart right now. And and whatever the devil tried to use to shatter your heart, the anointing binds up your broken heart and makes it whole again. And things that used to trouble you and make you sad that were like triggers, they won't have an effect on you anymore. The Lord fills your heart with joy. In Jesus' name. Glad you came. God bless you. (laughs) And then you. Your physical heart. All five ventricles, if I remember right from my seventh grade health class. In the name of Jesus, the Lord strengthens all five of those parts of the heart. And then as the blood pumps properly, that'll strengthen all the rest of the body. And then if there's any, uh, what do they call the things? Clots. God dissolves them all. Your legs won't be sore or any of that kind of stuff. Sound good? Real great. Okay, good. Because you're, you're a real New Englander. I couldn't tell whether you were enjoying the word or not. So before I put my hands on you, I wanted to make sure you didn't want to kill me. <laughs> I didn't want them to find me in a parking lot in Dorchester. Be healed in Jesus' name. No shortness of breath. And you'll just have like an overflow of strength. In Jesus' name. Nice to meet you. God bless you. Well, I'm done. Stand on your feet, everybody. Where are you from? I've seen you somewhere else, right? I'm from Boston. Uh, I lived in uh, Fitchburg. My nephew Nick brought me to you last last year. Nick Gregoria in uh, in Fitchburg. He's coming with me tonight with three of his friends. Oh, that's awesome! This place is going to pack out. Yeah. Praise the Lord. I didn't come this far. I forgive you. Believe me. <laughs> How many of you can tell you can receive something from the Lord today? Well, this is the opening day. Then tonight is going to be a Holy Ghost blowout service. So 7 o'clock, not only come, but come expecting something for you, and then bring whoever you feel to bring, and we're going to have a great night. The whole week's going to be off the hook. Glad I got to meet you. Everybody that gave their life to the Lord today? I'm proud of you. You're going to do great things for God. All the people who didn't have to drive that far from Connecticut, I'm so glad you don't have to drive back to upstate New York. God bless you. So glad you all came. Well, I can tell everyone's hungry, so I'm going to quit talking. I bless you in Jesus' name. I'll see you tonight at 7. Please welcome for a proper benediction the handsomest pastor in all of Connecticut, <laughs> Pastor Greaves, as he comes to close things out. No offer. <laughs> Amen. Wasn't a blessing today. Amen. Why don't we just lift up our hands? Father, we thank you for this opportunity we've had to come into your house, Lord, and encounter you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that it only takes one encounter to change our lives forever. And I believe today, Lord, lives were changed. Lives were, 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 were mended and healed and restored today, Father. Tonight, we come hungry. We come, we come desperate, Lord. We come, Lord, expecting to receive from you. So, Father, as we leave today, may we tell those who we come in contact with what the Lord has done in our lives. We worship you. We thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. See you tonight at 7 p.m. It's going to be great. God bless you. Amen.